There's a spot now where all the Ubers go. Hi, we'll start in about 30 seconds. You think it's sad? <laughs> the pizza's ready. Carol, Carol, check the pizza. <laughs> Uh, good evening. It's seven o'clock here in the northeast of the rainy, stormy United States. And this is the Tibet Center, Kunchab Tarduling, a Buddhist meditation and study center located in New York City and northern New Jersey. And this is our twice weekly presentation of the Buddha Dharma, specifically stages on the path to enlightenment and related topics. Any problems with the picture or sound, please call me right away. Or no, call me text. Much better. Or Mr. Smith. All the prayers we say are on the website in the FAQ section. Scroll down to prayers. There is someone for whom you want us to pray for who has passed away recently. Place their names in the chat box so everyone can see it. So when we do the sutra of the recollection of the three jewels, people will remember them and pray for them. We are eagerly awaiting the return of our fearless leader, Nikki Freeland, Rato Kensa took the Lundo, who was flying in from Taiwan. He was in the Taiwan earthquake. He gets to San Francisco and all the flights are delayed and he spends many hours there. He's finally in the air from San Fran now and we'll pick him up after midnight at Newark if all things go well. Uh, probably have to bring a boat there because we have very heavy flooding. I hope the turnpike still is there. But it's he's had a day. <laughs> he's had a two-day day. So anyway, the Dharma goes on. So prayer for the spreading of the teachings throughout the length and breadth of the West. And I'll go over the topics after the prayers. By the force of the blessings of the non-fallacious three precious gems and of the truth of our pure selfless wishes, may the precious Buddhist teachings flourish and spread to the expanse of all areas throughout the length and breadth of the West. For all the people living here together with their near ones who have engaged in the teachings and have faith and respect for them, May all conditions adverse to their practice of the pure Dharma be dispelled and an excellent collection of favorable conditions increase like the waxing moon. And especially for those on work, who work on methods to accomplish the flourishing and spreading of the victorious one's teachings, which are the source of benefit and happiness. May they never be oppressed by masses of interference and adverse conditions. And may this spontaneously happen just as we have hoped and wished. The Heart Sutra. <laughs> Thus have I heard once, the Blessed One was dwelling in the royal domain of the Vulture Peak Mountain, together with a big gathering of great monks and great bodhisattvas. At that time, the Blessed One entered the Samadhi, which examines the Dharma, is called profound illumination. And at the same time, noble Avalokiteshvara, the bodhisattva, Mahasattva, looking at the profound practice of transcendent knowledge, saw the five skandhas in their natural emptiness. Then, through the inspiration of the Buddha, Venerable Shariputra said to Avalokiteshvara, how should those noble ones learn who wish to follow the profound practice of transcendent knowledge? And Avalokiteshvara answered, Venerable Shariputra, whoever wishes to follow the profound practice of transcendent knowledge should look at it like this, seeing the five skandhas in their natural emptiness. Form is empty. Emptiness itself is form. Emptiness is not separate from form. Form is not separate from emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discriminating awareness, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Thus, all the dharmas are empty and have no characteristics. They are unborn and unceasing. They are not impure or pure. They need to decrease nor increase. Therefore, since there is emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discriminating awareness, no compositional factors, no consciousness. No eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no appearance, no sound, no smell, no taste, no sensation, no objects of mind, no quality of sight, no quality of hearing, no quality of smelling, no quality of tasting, no quality of sensing, no quality of thought, no quality of mind consciousness. There are no nidanas for ignorance, old age, and death, nor they're wearing out. There is no suffering, no cause of suffering, no ending of suffering, and no path, no wisdom, no attainment, no non-attainment. Therefore, since there is no attainment, 
The bodhisattvas abide by means of transcendent knowledge. And since there is no obscurity of mind, they have no fear. They transcend falsity and pass beyond the bounds of sorrow. All the Buddhas who dwell in the past, present, and future by means of transcendent knowledge fully and clearly awaken to unsurpassed, true, complete enlightenment. Therefore, the mantra of transcendent knowledge, the mantra of deep insight, the unsurpassed mantra, the unequaled mantra, the mantra which calms all suffering should be known as truth, for there is no deception. In transcendent knowledge, the mantra is proclaimed, Tayat Om Gate Gate Para Gate Para Sam Gate Bodhisoha. O Sharaputra, this is how a Bodhisattva Mahasattva should learn profound transcendent knowledge. Then the Blessed One arose from that Samadhi and praised the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Avalokiteshvara, saying, Good, good, O son of noble family, profound transcendent knowledge should be practiced just as you have taught, and the Tathagatas will rejoice. When the Blessed One had said this, Shariputra and Navalokiteshvara, that whole gathering and the world with its gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, their hearts full of joy, praised the words of the Blessed One. Refuge and Bodhisattva vow, which you know we say three times, and we will do that. With the wish to free all beings, I shall always go for refuge to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha until I reach full enlightenment. Inspired by wisdom and compassion, today in the Buddha's presence, I generate the mind intent on full awakening for the benefit of all sentient beings. As long as space endures, as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world. With the wish to free all beings, I shall always go for refuge to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha until I reach full enlightenment. Inspired by wisdom and compassion, today in the Buddha's presence, I generate the mind intent on full awakening for the benefit of all sentient beings. As long as space endures, as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world. With the wish to free all beings, I shall always go for refuge to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha until I reach full enlightenment. Inspired by wisdom and compassion, today in the Buddha's presence, I generate the mind intent on full awakening for the benefit of all sentient beings. As long as space endures, as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world. So, oh, yes, we've had a, a rough time here. <laughs> but uh, Nicholas Vreeland... That's his American name. Otto Kensler took from Linda. Will coming be coming back, so he will probably do the next classes for the next few weeks, months. I don't know. So I'll get a nice break. <laughs> so tonight we're going to continue. We'll do that first. We'll be four essential from the book Four Essential Buddhist Commentaries, a Library of Tibetan Works and Archives book, the explanation of the seventh Dalai Lama's poem. Uh, Song of the Four Mindfulness. It also has a title of uh, something about Dripping City or something like that. Anyway, it's very interesting because it's the current Dalai Lama commenting on a poem he wrote as the seventh Dalai Lama. Very interesting. So he can't complain about the, the writer. He is the in a way. It, uh, it's, what is it called? Dropping the Rain of Cities, another title it has. But we call it a spiritual song upholding the four mindfulnesses, which we had last night. But first, from this book, Song of the of, for a King, and this is not one of the verses from the Mahamudra poem of Saraha, but some question and answers regarding the nature of a generic image in the mind. So a student is questioning uh, Kenshin Trungpa Rinpoche, Trungu Rinpoche. And the question is, Rinpoche, you made some statements regarding generalized and linguistic abstractions. I never use those terms, but anyway. And I was wondering if you can go over that again. And Rinpoche says, I mention these as illustration of how bewildered appearances occur within the mind. Bewildered appearances occur within the mind. More specifically, I was talking about we experience outside objects and perceive our thinking mind 
without the mind and its object actually existing as two separate things. So no mind, it's there. They're not two separate things. When an object experienced by one of the senses appears in our mind, what appears is a generalized image or likeness of that thing. You think of something through the mental consciousness or you see something, but what the mind is registering is a generalized image of it. Don uh, Chi in Tibetan. Generic image is called something else sometimes, meaning generality. There's another one. Who knows? When an object experienced one of the sins appears, I'd say, okay. For example, if we imagine our home right now, it's a very good exercise. You imagine your house right now, your home. We will be able to create a, create a fairly clear and detailed picture of the various rooms, our furniture, and so forth, right? Think of it. You can do that right now. In spite of the vividness of this experience and it, and it's great de detail. None of these things are actually physically pre present within our mind. No, an image of them is present. So what's the problem? We can't carry all that stuff in our mind. There's no room. No. What is present is an image of it, a mere appearance. In the context of valid cognition, this is called a generalized or generic image abstracted from our experience. I also mentioned that sometimes this image in our mind could be a generalized sound or a linguistic abstraction, sound generality, they used to call it. For example, when the name of a person or the name of an object with which we are familiar comes to mind, that person or thing is not actually present. And yet, this name of the person or thing brings up associations with it. Furthermore, when we think of the name, we have not actually heard the sound of the name. We think of the name, but we haven't heard the sound of the name. You know, what, you know, what could we think of? Joe Biden or something, you know. But we didn't hear Joe Biden. We could think it's the president or so. A linguistic abstraction is like an image of a sound. So when they use that term, you run into a linguistic abstraction. It's an image of a sound. We did not actually hear that sound because someone did not actually say the name. And yet the image of that sound arose in our mind and brought with it all of the associations with the object or person we habitually refer to by using that word, and we feel their presence, etc., whatever, and we react accordingly. These are all examples of how something can arise vividly in the mind, a clear image or a re recollected sound, a name or a word, and yet it is empty of physical existence and therefore an empty manifestation. And that's what we deal with all day long. Now he asks a very strange uh, question about, is it true for uh, meditational deities? Now the answer is going to be, in terms of the Mahamudra way of explaining things, don't get confused, but just hear it and let it go. Maybe in the future you'll be interested. Um, it's not what we focus on, but to see how they focus on the mind, map the mind, map the mind's actions, how it does things, very interesting. Is this creation of a generalized image image true for, true for the visualization of meditational deities. We're taught to visualize Sankapa or Avalokiteshra or whoever your Yiram or deity is. The answer comes from Rinpoche. In the practice of the generation stage, the, the visualization of deities does involve the use of generalized images. However, the context of visualized deities is different from our discussion here. The introduction of a generalized of generalized images points to the fact that while we seem to see trees and rocks outside, what we imagine is not there, exactly not there. While we seem to hear in our mind the sound of a word or name, it is not there. By contrast, in the practice of the generation stage of the deity, we are mainly concerned with relative truth and not ultimate truth. We are mainly concerned with the aspect of lucidity and not the aspect of emptiness. We want it to appear. We're looking for the visual thing. We want to see that deity, right? In our discussion of the term generalized image, we are looking into emptiness, there, that. So, so the student comes back and says, it is my understanding that we are to come to Mahamudra practice without concepts, without fabrication, Yet from hearing these wonderful Dharma teachings, I now have many concepts. <laughs> I am expecting to have a certain experience in Mahamudra that has been described as spacious, clear, and lucid. Oh, we all have heard these things, and we're all looking for that, I think. Now I feel that these concepts are a hindrance and a support. 
How can something be a, a hindrance and a support? Maybe he thinks a crutch or something. I don't know. What to do with them? And if I do have an experience during my mudra practice, how do I know if it is really a fabrication of my mind? Is this for real or am I just hallucinating it? Questions that are always asked of, of lamas. The reply from uh, Kensa Rinpoche, the primary in intent of Mahamudra instruction is to teach us to be free of any attempt to control or alter the mind's nature. The mind's nature, not its behavior, its nature. The instructions are that in meditation, we should be free of any wish to create or maintain any particular mental state. In the Mahamudra tradition, the type of meditation that we, in which we pursue the experience of trying to achieve a particular state of mind is known as rainbow meditation. Don't worry about these terms because it's, it's technical to the, and, and ge generic to the type of instruction in the Mahamudra world. We are pursuing something beautiful for, for the experience. The problem with this is that we are trying to bring out a certain positive experience. This involves conceptual contrivance and altering the mind. That applies to all of us. So you're trying to bring out a certain experience. It involves conceptual contrivance and altering the mind. And we're trying to go beyond that. So you're hearing this maybe the first time. Get used to these terms. The very things that prevent us from experiencing mind's nature, which is not contrived and cannot be altered or changed. We want to see what's there without the overlay of our contrivance our conceptions or idea what it is and blah 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 what's underneath i gotta know i gotta know <laughs> no don't go that crazy <laughs> therefore instead of experiencing mind's nature we experience whatever it is that we have created mahamudra meditation is a direct experience of the mind as it is and not an attempt to alter or create it the mind's nature does not have to be changed and actually the true nature cannot be created or recreated right Buddha nature. Nevertheless, this instruction does not mean that we should allow ourselves to be distracted by thoughts or disturbing emotions. The freedom from alterations does not mean allowing ourselves to be drawn away. It means freedom from the conceptually directed meditation of attempting to achieve a certain state. Oh, I know it, and I'm going to get it. You don't know. Get rid of all the garbage, and the mind's nature is supposed to come to you. It's supposed to come on you. It's there already, but you're supposed to understand all that. I don't, but, you know, that's what they say. So, for example, while meditating, we may think, I must experience this emptiness. <laughs> the, mind, the mind is brilliant lucidity, and I must perceive this, perceive this lucidity. I heard it's clear and radiant. I got to see it. The primary intent of the instruction is to be free from this discursiveness. With regard, Rinpoche continues, with regard to your second question, it is difficult to ascertain immediately the nature of an experience in meditation. But over time, based on what happens to the experience, you will be able to tell whether it is an authentic experience of mind's nature or some kind of contrived experience. And our Rinpoche was to say, check the text. Even high lamas had a vision of Manjushri, so check the text, another lama would tell them. That is why it is said experiences vanish, experience vanishes like the mist. <laughs> so over time, if the experience does not develop but diminishes, that indicates that it was a temporary or contrived experience. However, if it gradually develops towards realization, this indicates that it was authentic. Of course, if you have a very good teacher with you, you can consult, you live near them, different story, and you will go to them right away, him or her. However, if it gradually develops toward realization, this indicates that it was authentic. You will have very few questions about this true experience because the wisdom of the experience itself will obviate theorizing questions about it. Very powerful. That's interesting. So this is what's ahead of us, whether it's Mahamudra or not. So the four essential Buddhist commentaries and within that, Seventh Dalai Lama's poem on the four mindfulnesses. We left off last night at the purity of the body. What is it? I was going to explain. Let me see. What was it? Mindfulness. Where is it? Come on, come on. 
The third verse, the mindfulness towards one's body as being a divine body. This is 131 of this book, Library of Tibetan Archives pamphlet. It's probably a new one out now, Four Essential Buddhist Commentaries, all by His Holiness. So the verse of the poem says, In the divine mansion of great bliss, pleasant to feel, abides the divine body, which is your own body of pure aggregates and constituents. It's designated now as pure, right? A deity with the three bodies inseparable is there. Three bodies is uh, Rupakaya, Dharmakaya, Sambhogakaya, or, you, well, not conceiving yourself to be ordinary because you're in a tantric meditation, the highest yoga mind. Practice divine pride and vivid appearance. Not letting your mind stray, place it within the profound and the manifest, making your attention unforgettable. Maintain it with the profound and the manifest. That's the verse. His Holiness's commentary is this. The first line speaks of a divine mansion of great bliss, pleasant to feel. Yeah, that's we all want that, right? <laughs> you should know that within Tantra, there are four divisions or classifications. This first relates to the Anattara Yoga Tantra, the highest yoga tantra. It can be explained in terms of either the generation stage or the completion stage. And I shall explain it in terms of the generation stage. The completion stage is hard to get instruction on. It's a little more strict. Uh, anyway, but there's text, there's things to read, there's places people are presenting it. If you have some background, you'll understand what they're saying. If you don't, it won't hurt. So, so what would hurt if you have pledges within that experience, within, within the instruction or the uh, initiation itself, and you don't keep them. If you sincerely, but if you're going to the initiation to see what it's all about, that's different. If you're going there, say, oh, yes, I want to, so, and, and I, whatever the Rinpoche says to do, I'll do it. If you don't do it, uh, <laughs> it's all good. You broke, you broke the commitment. So, so don't take the commitment if you can't hold it. That's all. I'm back again next week. <laughs> I don't know. So I'll explain in terms of the, of the generation stage. The first four lines of the verse relates to the purity of one's abode and all that it contains. When you experience yourself as a deity, you don't only experience yourself as a deity, and that's not, no, you're in, in a, a celestial mansion. You're not in your apartment or whatever, you know. Your pup tent, who knows. You imagine you are in a mandala. You imagine you have all the assets that a deity would have. Abilities, retinue, etc. There, there's instruction on it. So I shall explain that. There are two purities here. One is the exist in the middle of one, you exist in the middle of such a divine mansion, which is completely immaculate. It's really perfect. That's that. In terms of purity of your body, your abode is completely immaculate. Your body, you visualize yourself as having a divine body of pure aggregates and constituents, completely pure. Furthermore, imagine your body, speech, and mind as inseparable, your body being the emanation body, or rupakaya, your speech, the enjoyment body, or sambhogakaya, right? And your mind, the truth body, or yes, indeed, the dharma kaya, right? Whereas normally one's body, speech, and mind are of different natures, but now one imagines, key word, imagines, these to be inseparable from and of the same nature as that of, of, of the Buddha. You are imagining yourself already having arrived at Buddhahood. Be careful. Because <laughs> maybe you're not. The idea is to get used to the position of Buddhahood, the possibility of it and everything. And with your training, you know Buddhahood was caused. Buddhas and jump up and become a Buddha as soon as he was as soon as existence occurred he was ordinary like us he was jealous he was uh, you know fearful the whole bit whatever we have wrong he studied practiced developed and became that buddha we have this situation available to us we have the instructions We're very ready to even hear this and we have the lamas upholding this and the sangha personnel helping this teachings to go on and stay alive very lucky so all we have to do is apply the method. So it's not so pie in the sky. It's not so strange how could this happen. It can happen. 
you create the cause, you get the result. Have you heard that before? <laughs> That's it. However, creating the cause, well, it takes work. <laughs> you don't just imagine and wish it, and there I am. Don't insult me, I'm a deity. No, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> so, now one imagines those to be inseparable from them and of the same nature as that of the Buddha. When we are speaking of the mind, this is conceived of as the Buddha mind or truth body or Dharmakaya, if you like that word. This refers to what? Now be careful here. The subtle mind or lung, subtle energy current perhaps, not the mind, the surface mind or the coarse minds, etc. Very subtle mind. That's what we're talking about here. What he's talking about, and I'm repeating. Right at the present time, we possess the requirements to bring about such a transformation, as we just said, or to bring about Buddhahood, as this might be called, as this might be called. So, that, you know, what, abandoning the conception of being ordinary, one must cultivate the divine pride, looking upon oneself as a fully enlightened being and visualizing oneself vividly as such. Now, what are the tools you need to do that? You need a calm mind, some sort of shamatha to abide on it. You need intelligence. You need good learning background. You need good ethics because in order to attain good ethics, a calm mind, you have to have a steady mind, not disturbed by thoughts over here, over there. I want that. I want this. I don't want this. Okay. Chatter, chatter, chatter. You have to keep good ethics to set the stage for your development of a very calm mind and a calm view of the world. Keeping vows is important that way. And then you need the intelligence of instruction, given to you by instructions. How do I sit? What do I think? What procedures? You do this within a ritual, of course. The sadhana has helped you. The, you have within it the confession, the, the bodhicitta motivation, the purification, uh, that's a confession, offerings, the whole shmir. So, there are things created now that you can go through and go through them daily so they start to imprint deeper and deeper in your mind and you start to genuinely turn onto the right path. But be careful when they say your mind, they're talking about mind has a lot of levels. So here he says the most subtle mind or lung and the subtle energy current perhaps. So, so you know what lung is, you know lung energy, you know what lung is, Carol? Yes. No, lung is like they say wind because no way of expressing the light and the moving, the movement factor, and uh, it, with it is the the intelligence factor, always together. The mind always has lung with it, subtle energy with it, coarse energy too, but you subtle, 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 like a horse and rider. The horse doesn't know where to go, but can really move. The rider knows where to go. We can't run like the horse. They're always together. It's symbiotic relationship, always at all times, all through your lives, right now. So that's important. So right at the present time, we possess the requirements of bringing up this. This might be called blah, blah. We said that already. What is the purpose of this? They might ask. I didn't ask. Well, someone asked. The true or ultimate refuge is called the resultant refuge. In other words, the Buddha you are going to become. You know? This is Buddha, viewed not as another being outside of or different from oneself, but as that which one will become following the exhaustion of the impurities of one's body, speech, and mind. So it's things you're casting away, not things you have to go and get and bring here and put that here, put that. No, as you do these things, you're throwing away, throwing away, to get to your real, actual Buddha nature, your real purity. It's a different setup then. You have to think differently now. I got it already. What do I have to do to bring it up? It's here. The Zen statement is a bit more. You meet a Buddha in the road, kill him. In other words, you see anything external. That's not the Buddha we're talking about. We want you to see the Buddha that you are. They would say in Zen, something like that. It's been a long time since I sat in the New York Zen Center. Ay, ay, ay. Uh, how long? Close to 50 years. <laughs> but I've been around for a while. So anyway, enough of this. So what's the purpose? To the, it comes about as an exhaustion, a purification. As we said, 
a piece of gold in the ground. No one knows where it is. First of all, it's there and it looks like junk, but someone knows it's nature and cleans it. Whoa, we have gold here, guys. Same thing. We have that more valuable than gold. <laughs> it's not physical. So, so that's that. Okay. The next verse says, not letting your mind stray. Place it within the profound and the manifest. Profound, we already know what that is. That's empty, it's manifest. What's coming out of emptiness, pure. The profound here is referring to emptiness and the manifest to the visualization of one's own body as a divine body. You need the background of a good understanding of emptiness. You may not have a direct vision of it, actual experience of it, but you need a good background. You get that by study. And that's the mind's part. You know, the profound is emptiness, right? These two together are said to be the union, a big word, union. A lot of times to represent this in rituals, the uh, Lama will do this, cross showing the union of you know, emptiness and, and, and uh, manifest, the profound and the manifest, etc. among other things. Sometimes male and female, the females representing uh, wisdom, the male, the, the compassion or energy portion, a lot of unions, but there's an outer gesture done to help people understand that. And also the one who's doing it is in a certain state. So it's called the union of method and wisdom. In non-Buddhist tantras, one is taught mere visualization of oneself as a deity. Where in Buddhist tantra, one visualizes oneself in the mandala of the deity and the deity itself within this emptiness. This is a uniquely Buddhist tantric practice. And the mandala itself, the mansion, the blah, 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 with all the entrances and all the retinue, manifested by the central figure, the deity. So you imagine that you've created this. You know, it's interesting to note that uh, outside all these mandalas, what circles it? A cemetery, a charnel ground, a horrible place and everything. One of the meanings of that, I was told, is that you have to understand impermanence. That's what that represents before you get into the higher thing understand the way things are flowing all the time impermanent and there's other reasons for that many other reasons for that charnel ground or cemetery whatever so uh oh what happened? the pipes <laughs> what they hold the next verse concerns mindful of the view of emptiness okay there are really Two verses. The first refers to the space-like meditation during meditative equipoise. Space, these are important words. Space-like meditation during equipoise in the actual experience of the non-dual realization of emptiness, okay? Like meditation during the meditative equipoise, whereas the second refers to the illusion. What's the illusion? The illusion-like meditation in the post-meditational period here is the first of these two verses. Throughout the circle of appearing and occurring objects of knowledge pervades the space of clear light, which is reality. The ultimate, right? An inexpressible mode of being of objects is there. Forsaking mental fabrications, look to the entity of immaculate emptiness. Not letting your mind stray, place it within reality. That's Darren, no. Making your attention unforgettable, maintain it within reality. He's emphasizing you have to be right on this, okay? Making your attention unforgetful, maintain it within reality. Unforgetful. I was, so here's the his holiness, current holiness, Dalai Lama's comment on his own work seven lifetimes ago. <laughs> I don't know what that feels like. It's amazing. <laughs> He's criticizing himself, maybe. <laughs> in speaking of the appearing and appearing and occurring objects of knowledge, we mean every type of phenomenon, every type of entity that exists, be they good or bad, be, be, be they of the nature of cyclic existence or of the nature of nirvana. Every one of these phenomena includes emptiness. That's it. Emptiness pervades. It's there. That is to say, all types of phenomena, whatever exists, is pervaded by emptiness. That means that all phenomena are mere names, being merely imputed by conceptions and therefore lacking inherent identity, so their nature is emptiness. For this reason, it is said that all phenomena are pervaded by emptiness 
as their ultimate mode of existence. An, exp an inexpressible mode of being of objects is there. That's a line from the poem. Why is this mode of being called inexpressible? Because phenomena do not exist in the manner in which they are apprehended or seen. We don't see them the way they exist. Of course, unless you're a high yogi. We see inherent existence. They exist in another fashion and are accordingly said to be inexpressible because of that. This is the mode of being a phenomena. Individual things are merely imputed by conceptions. So here's some technique that he's talking about now. Make sure I have enough time. Yeah, we have enough time. In order to realize this, one has, in meditation, to forsake mental fabrications or conceptualization and direct the mind to the absence of inherent existence. That is to say, direct it to this emptiness. So you get rid of the chattering mind. Have the idea of emptiness that you've learned about, you've studied, you've really inculcated into your being, and you put the mind directly on that. You have come abiding at this point, I'm assuming. However, you got there. Hmm? So you stay there. This emptiness is called immaculate emptiness. Fixing the mind on this without letting it stray is called the space-like meditation, the space-like meditative equipoise. Experience itself. Furthermore, this emptiness of phenomena is not something that we have made or which occurs by the blessing of the Buddha or whoever, rather it has existed from the moment phenomena came into existence. Always was. This already is the ultimate mode of existence, lacking existence, lacking all traits of inherent being. We don't see it. Huh? But we think we discovered it or we created it. No, it's always there. We haven't, we are blinded somewhat. The next and final verse relates to this illusion like meditation. After the formal meditation period and, and runs this way. So you come out of this. Things are different. Right? The first time, of course, and each time, the deeper you get, things are different when you come back to the out of that equipoise where you're seeing duality again. Things you're seeing stuff. So here's the verse that expresses that situation. At the crossroads of the vari varieties of appearances and the six cons consciousnesses, the different sense consciousness, including the mental, right, taste, touch. At the crossroad of the varieties of appearances and the six consciousnesses is seen the confusion of the baseless phenomena of duality. The illusory spectacle of, this, of a deceiving magician are there. Spectacles of a deceiving magician are there. Not thinking they are true, look to their entity of emptiness. Don't get fooled. In other words, now you've seen what's behind this. Don't Take the bait again. Not thinking they are true, look to their entity of emptiness. Not letting your mind stray, place it with appearance and emptiness. It's appearing, but it's empty. Making your attention unforgettable, maintain it with appearance and emptiness. You realize how the mind has to be controlled to do these things. So, this verse, His Holiness now comments on his previous Holiness kind of work. This verse directs us to imagine first that across the road a magician is performing his acts that is creating spectacles, illusions, hallucinations in which although no horses or elephants exist, they seem real to the passerby to whose visual consciousness they appear. Oh, look at that. Look at this. The horses and elephants are not actually there. Nevertheless, one apprehends them as being there. Inherent existence isn't exactly actually there, but we apprehend inherent existence as being actually there 24-7. Oh, that's our situation. Yeah. <laughs> it's my situation. Anyway, I don't know about, maybe you're all yogis. You're having a good laugh listening. <laughs> Taking this as the illustration, we now go to the fact, which is that we have our own six consciousness all of them polluted by ignorance, all of them apprehending what ain't there, inherent existence, which never existed. Uh, we project it out. <laughs> so that the phenomena appear to us as if they had inherent existence independent of the observer. There is no inherent existence. So how do we see it? The observer is adding it. Who's the observer? Me, you. Ouch. 
So that's the situation. In fact, from the very out, uh, outset, they have never existed in that way, Beely, being merely imputed or imagined conceptions. Nevertheless, they appear as if they were truly existent in themselves. Oh, yeah. Why? Pourquoi? Why? <laughs> because of the pollution of our own consciousness by the force of ignorance. That's why. I'll tell you why. <laughs> All right, let's not get carried away. I'm telling myself to calm down. In terms of the ultimate mode of existence of the phenomena, they are said to be of one flavor or completely imaginary. When this emptiness is manifest in the form of, a conven of conventional phenomena, we find divisions such as good and bad, wholesome and unwholesome, and so forth. Nevertheless, the ultimate mode of phenomena has but one flavor. One flavor, emptiness. Previously, that is, during a formal meditation, one has sought the object imputed, but having sought it, one has not found it. It's not the thing that I think, it's not there, ouch. One has sought the inherent existence of the object, but one has not found it, and thus come to realize the absence of any inherent nature or independent existence. That's what you realize. Some people say it's terrifying because that's what we think is reality, and then suddenly reality is presenting itself differently. We're panicking, we're thinking, where is going away? One guy grabbed his collar in the stories they tell. You're not, we're just so used to what isn't there. We feel comfortable in it. Having attained this realization, on rising from meditation, one looks upon phenomena as they appear to oneself and sees that they appear as if they were truly and independently existent. Yes, you're not a Buddha yet. So you come out of this, and now you're seeing things again. They say sometimes, they use the word illusion, like it's in a movie, it's stuff that's coming. And you say, oh, yeah, you look like this. Don't fool me. I know what the real underlying reality is now. So you see it. And having all these appearances to your mind blocks omniscience. So you don't, you're not a Buddha until you got rid of even those appearances. Because th then when you're a Buddha, you're fully omniscient. It's a different story. You're still ascension being, but you're not going with it. So your character is gra gradually improving. The more you go deeper into emptiness, the more of your afflictions are purified. And you go up the stages of, if you're in the Mahayana, the uh, Bodhisattva path, the 10 stages of a bodhisattva, the bhumis, the grounds, whatever. And you get more and more purified. You drop off this, you drop off that. So your true nature comes up nice and clean, more powerful, the whole bit. Everything you wanted is there. <laughs> so one looks upon phenomena as they appear to oneself and sees that they appear as if they were truly independently existent. However, owing to the force of one's previous realization during meditation, one recognizes that they do not exist in the manner in which they appear. Okay? So this completes the explanation of this. Song of the Four Mindfulnesses. This is an extremely concise or synthesized explanation of the practice involving the union of sutra and tantra. There's a lot in there. You can take every word. And, or there's a lot of other texts that not as, uh, not as concise as only some self has spoken on this topic many times. Watch on YouTube any of his long addresses that he gives, several days teachings. This stuff is usually in there. I rely on him. It's very and I, I'm used to his use of his vocabulary and what he, you know, how he uses words, etc. There are other lamas, very good, different sects, different schools. You just have to get used to their terminology because they may be using the same word but need, meaning something else, like a liar when the when the uh, Cargues and Enigmas use a liar. It means something different than we use. The uh, yellow hat sex use we. I can't call myself a member of that. But anyway, anyway, that's that. So it is up to oneself whether or not one practices the Dharma or any religion. It's up to you. It is up to oneself whether one wishes to follow Buddhist Dharma or not. However, in the following, the Buddha Dharma of the Tibetan, in following the Buddha Dharma of the T Tibetan tradition, one seeks to bring about the union of method and wisdom of Sutra and Tantra. So now our time has just run out. I must give thanks to you all. That's His Holiness speaking. We still have a little time. <laughs> but uh, I didn't time it right. Otherwise, it would have been a great exit from the stage, you know? Not really. This ain't Hollywood. It never will be, thankfully. So we're getting back to work now. I don't know what Nikki will be teaching. I assume he'll be teaching the Lamrim. But I'll give you some background now from Geshe Sopa. So 
there will be continuity if he goes to the Lamrim. He has his own way of explaining that he has been very well schooled. He's schooled by debate, etc. And his monastery that he was the abbot of is a specialist in debate. So he knows the terms. And he has several students in India, young monks, still has them. So he knows how to present the material. So we're very lucky. Hang on, I have to get fueled up. Good old espresso. Empty yet manifest. <laughs> I'm going to read from chapter 13 of volume 5 of the good book, Yeshe Sopas Stages on the Path to Enlightenment. He's, he's commenting on the misinterpretation of Svatantrika and Prasangika. The two highest schools, Madhyamaka schools in Buddhism are the consequent school, Prasangika, and the Svatantrika school, the autonomous school sometimes, so-called. So rather than give you my idea, let's get Geshe Sopas commenting on commentary on this so you can understand what the nature of their arguments are, why they use them, what their ideas behind it is. And bear in mind the highest schools for Sangika, but the highest school may not be best for certain levels of, of spiritual training. You may be better off with the lowest school, getting a hold of that and going up. Most likely that's the best way to proceed. However, here it is now. So whether to use consequence or autonomous syllogism in negating the object of negation. So this is generic information you could use, you know, on, on the, the, the spiritual path. <laughs> there are two different logical procedures they use to negate the object of negation. You want to get rid of uh, inherent existence. How do we logically work on that? The logical consequence method for Sankhika is used that, and the autonomous Vatantrika uh, uh, method, which Sankhapa glosses as autonomous syllogism. Those who favor logical consequences are called prasangikas or consequence school. And those who favor autonomous syllogism are called svatantrikas or autonomous school, whatever, something like that. Both methods are based on the writing of Nagarjuna and Aryadeva. Both are legit. Different people need certain techniques. The svatantrikas say that Nagarjuna and Aryadeva, his student, employ autonomous syllogisms. The prasangikas say that these masters employ consequences. In this corner, etc. You know what? You got it. Which of these should we use? You have to learn both, by the way. <laughs> For many reasons. Since we're all going to become Buddhists, we're going to also have to teach everyone of different levels. We have to know the level to present when we become teachers. And how do you get there? By studying them now. Even Buddha had to study these things and learn these. Remember, he didn't come instantly a Buddha. No, he worked. No. Before we can ask these questions, we have to understand what consequences and autonomous syllogisms are, and that's my point in bringing this up. Then we can consider which procedure gives rise to the view understanding emptiness. Therefore, this topic has two parts. The meaning of consequence and autonomous syllogisms. This next uh, two chapters, 13, 4, 3 chapters. And which system to follow as so as to develop the correct view in one's mental continuum. Chapter 16. Well, that's his uh, Yeshe Sopa's numeration. Let me make sure, yeah, not the Lamrim Chenmo numeration. He's broken the text up into his own uh, units of explanation. We could say that without getting into trouble. The meaning of consequence in autonomy. Until around the 6th century, there was just a general undifferentiated Madhyamaka system. The distinction between Svatantrika and Prasanga systems did not arise until the time of Buddhapalita's or, authorship of his great commentary on Nagarjuna's fundamental treatise called Buddhapalita's commentary on the fundamental treatise. That's what it's called. What you see is what you get. Or the Buddhapalita for short. Well, I don't hang out with crowds that use the Buddhapalita. So <laughs> we'll use a regular long name. In his commentary, Buddhapalita uses consequences as a logical procedure throughout, showing you the, the consequences of your own thinking, reducing it to absurdity. Oh, that's true. That follows from this, from this. Yeah, you're right. That kind of idea. 
You're trying to inculcate that in the opponent's mind using their own words, their own. So. He does not explicitly discuss his choice of logical method, though it is a departure from the more common use of autonomous syllogisms in Indian logic at the time. Thank God we're not there. We thank whoever you think. This is evident in his commentary on Nagarjuna's fundamental treatise all the way through from the very first stanza. Not from self, from others, not from both, not without a cause. Anything, anywhere does not arise at any time. We're not going to debate that or go around the, the, the block with that one right now. We've had that and we'll have it again. In this stanza, Nag Nagarjuna is negating various views, both Buddhist and non-Buddhist, as well as a subtler type of view that underlies them. Buddha Palata presents the argument here as a consequence that reveals the contradictions implied by these views. He shows that if someone believes any of these four types of arisings to be true, inherently true, exist as appears, yada, yada, okay, it contradicts another view that his or her philosophy or philosophical school believes to be true. In other words, he demonstrates that each of these four possible means of arising has unacceptable consequences for those who hold it to be true using their own presentation of reality and showing them that you're not in sync with what you've been proposing or propounding, even better word. How to parse the meaning of this stanza will be discussed later in this volume for now. It is enough to understand that Buddha polity uses consequences rather than autonomous syllogism to negate the four alternative ways of arising. So let me see what time we have. Oh, about a another minute. Another paragraph, that's all. Because we'll, you, I don't know if Nikki's going to pick this up, but I will later on when, if, if I ever resume here, I don't know. You know, maybe we'll get a good geisha in and then we'll get them to do it because I need help. You know. Some decades later, Baba Viveka wrote an extensive commentary in the Fundamental Treatise in which he criticized Buddha Palata's methodology. Ooh. <laughs> he argues that Buddha Palata can neither refute his opponents nor prove his own position because he does not use autonomous syllogism. So there. According to Baba Viveka, the final step of an argument must employ an autonomous syllogism, a consequent an argument, a consequence, an argument in the form, if you accept this, then that would follow, does not have power from its own side to prove or refute anything. That's what he's saying. Baba Viveka stresses the need to use autonomous syllogism as a final proof. Therefore, he is called the reopener of the Svatantrika system. Are you glad to hear that? I'm sure you are. Anyway, we'll leave it at that because these terms are going to be banged around all the time. Nikki knows them well. Nikki knows very simple ways of explaining them too, which has helped me a lot. So, hope he stays healthy. He's had quite a few days. He's lucky. He life-threatening situation he was in in Taiwan. So he said the road started doing this, and you're in a cab on a road on a cliff. Oh, boy. <laughs> so, we have any names, Darren? Yeah. Okay. So, hold on. The earthquake victims and Joe Flaherty? The earthquake victims and Joe Flaherty? Yes. Oh, fine guy. He's a writer, right? Did you hear that Maurizio Polini died? Mark mentioned STV. that? STV. STV. What is it? Hold on. Sorry, I can't hear what... SCTV. SCTV, oh, okay. And Maurizio Polini died? Yeah. Maurizio Polini. Maurizio. Oh, Maurizio, the male. Oh, the pianist. pianist oh, yeah, yeah, Maurizio. Mark, 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 I think he mentioned him last night. My mind's like a sieve. You know. okay. If I didn't have espresso, I probably wouldn't talk. All right. Whoever else you wish to pray for, there's plenty of people in dire straits now in our world. Recollection of the Noble Three Jewels. I prostrate to the Omniscient One. Thus the Buddha, Bhagavad, Tathagata, Arahat, Samyak, Sang Buddha, the learned and virtuous one, the Sugata, the knower of the world, the charioteer and tamer of beings, the unsurpassable one, the teacher of devas and humans is the Buddha, Bhagavad. The Tathagata is in accord with all merit. He does not waste the roots of virtue. He is completely ornamented with all patience. He is the basis of the treasures of merit. He is adorned with the minor marks. He blossoms with the flowers of the major marks. His activity is timely and appropriate. Seeing him, he is without disharmony. He brings true joy to those who long with faith. His knowledge cannot be overpowered. 
His strengths cannot be challenged. He is the teacher of all sentient beings. He is the father of bodhisattvas. He is the king of noble ones. He is the guide of those who journey to the city of Nirvana. He possesses immeasurable wisdom. He possesses inconceivable confidence. His speech is completely pure. His melody is pleasing. One never has enough of seeing him. His form is incomparable. He is not stained by the realm of desire. He's not stained by the realm of form. He's not affected by the formless realm. He is completely liberated from suffering. He is completely and utterly liberated from the skandhas. He is not possessed with datus. His ayatanas are controlled. He has completely cut the knots. He is completely liberated from extreme torment. He is liberated from craving. He has crossed over the river. He is perfected in all the wisdoms. He abides in the wisdom of the Buddha Bhagavats, who arise in the past, present, and future. He does not abide in nirvana. He abides in the ultimate perfection. He dwells in the bhumi where he sees all sentient beings. All these are the perfect virtues of the greatness of the Buddha Bhagavat. The holy dharma is good at the beginning, good in the middle, and good at the end. Its meaning is excellent. Its words are excellent. It is uncorrupted. It is completely perfect and completely pure. It completely purifies. The Bhagavad teaches the Dharma well. It brings complete vision. It is free from sickness. It is always timely. It directs one further. Seeing it fulfills one's purpose. It brings discriminating insight for the wise. The Dharma, which is taught by the Bhagavad, is revealed properly in the Vinaya. It is renunciation. It causes one to arrive at perfect enlightenment. It is without contradiction. It is pithy. It is trustworthy and puts an end to the journey. As for the Sangha of the great Jnana, they enter completely. They enter insightfully. They enter straightforwardly. They enter harmoniously. They are worthy of veneration with joy and palms. They are worthy of receiving prostration. They are a field of glorious merit. They are completely capable of receiving all gifts. They're an object of generosity. They're a great object of complete generosity. The protector who possesses great kindness, the omniscient teacher, the basis of oceans of merit and virtue, I prostrate to the Tathagata. Pure, the cause of freedom from passion. Virtuous, liberating from the lower realms. This alone is the supreme ultimate truth. I prostrate to the Dharma, which is peace. Having been liberated, they show the path to liberation. They are fully dedicated to the disciplines. They are a holy field of merit and possess virtue. I prostrate to the Sangha. I prostrate to the Buddha, the leader. I prostrate to the Dharma, the protector. I prostrate to the Sangha, the community. I prostrate respectfully and always to these three. Buddha's virtues are inconceivable. The Dharma's virtues are inconceivable. The Sangha's virtues are inconceivable. Having faith in these inconceivables, therefore the fruitions are inconceivable. May they be born in a completely pure realm. And all this conflict and strife end immediately. I have no power. So the next Dharma class will be given by Venerable Vreeland, I assume. It'll be next Tuesday night in New York City at the Settlement House. If not, someone will pinch, in me, pinch hit me or somebody or someone he has to teach. But Saturday, we have Tara here in the Parsonage in South Orange at 1 o'clock. Everyone is welcome. Hopefully, it's a day without rain Saturday. It's predicted to be a nice sunny day, a little cool. And we have uh, the Sedana at the 1 o'clock. It's over about 10 to 2, quarter of 2. And then we have a nice uh, luncheon of potluck cover dish, whatever. People bring stuff. You can sit and lounge around, go upstairs and read a book, whatever. And we have a half hour of silent meditation included around, I think, 3.30. You ring the gong. So that's that. So everyone should wish Mr. Smith a happy birthday, Sunday, April 7th. He puts up with a lot. To keep it. He's probably very mad that I mentioned it, but that's too bad. And, and so... So we expect uh, we'll pick Mick, Nikki up at the airport tonight around midnight. So he'll be here, and then Ling Rinpoche will be visiting. The event's already sold out. We have a limited space in the venue that we rented, but he will be here discussing the future of the Tibet Center with us. So we'll get a clear view 
of where this place is going. It's been around since 1975. We want it to be around much more longer than that. So thanks for your kind, patient listening. Big luck, to, love to all of you. And good luck to you. <laughs> you have it or you want me to do it? Okay.